Hey, it's Chuck. I'm Terry, WBNS. Coach, you've said that you've seen an edge with this club in practice. How important is that? How do you, what do you do as a head coach to enhance that? Do you think these guys are ready to play a game now? Yeah, it goes back to how we practice. And if we're going to play that way, we have to practice that way. And again, this is, you know, age old commentary. But, you know, if if we expect to play with an edge, we got to practice with an edge. If we're going to play tough, we got to practice tough. If we're going to, you know, have guys, you know, getting their hands on balls in the back end, then we got to do it in practice. If we're going to have guys finishing down the field, then we got to do that in practice. If we have guys playing, you know, on punt return who are going, you know, 12 seconds on a return rep as hard as they possibly can go, that's got to happen in practice. And so we just continue to create those environments and demand that there's there's that. Now, for this team, we haven't really had to demand it that hard. I mean, they, when it's time to go, when you put the ball down, they're going at it hard. But the, that's our job as coaches to create that environment because, you know, as the saying goes, you're going to sink back to the level of your training. And so we have to make sure that that happens every day in practice. And, um, you know, good news is it's been like that in practice, but it's going to continue. Let's get it. And welcome into Chuck on Bucks on a Wednesday. Appreciate you all so much. Guys, we're one more day from another round of college football. Tomorrow night, we got Colorado and North Dakota State on at the same time as North Carolina and Minnesota. I think we're going to have some competitive football games to hold us over because really we're just three sleeps away from Buckeye football. We go to sleep Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, and we wake up. And then we got to wait till 3.30. But it, that's it. That's the day. We got Clemson and Georgia to hold us over starting at noon. And like I said, I think it's going to be close. You keep telling me I'm crazy. We'll see. We'll talk about it on Saturday afternoon when we come on the Juck on Bucks channel for the postgame show. Postgame show for the Buckeyes. Game starts at 3.30. We'll come on late in the fourth. Start recapping everything we uh, everything we saw. And there will be tons to talk about, that's for sure. Got a couple guests, my buddy Ron James for one, um, Dan Sanchez for two, and uh, maybe a couple more surprise guests. We'll see what happens. But that's going to be a whole lot of fun. I watched the Stallions documentary, and you know I don't want to talk much about it. I just got a couple of thoughts. Also, we had press conferences from Ryan Day, Jim Knowles, and Will Howard, and Dylan was there. Here's here's how this went down. So Dylan got done with the press conference. I only had ch a chance to look at some of the notes. I didn't have a chance to watch it. So Dylan just had a you know, brief window of time to hop on with me, and he did. So we go through and we do our, our talk about the press conference. Afterwards, I'm sitting here working, and I've got the press conference on in the background. And I hear Ryan Day something say something. And I rewound it and I listened to it again and I rewound it and I listened to it again. And I called Dylan. I said, Dylan, listen, this is what I just heard. And here's what I'm taking away from it. Did you take away the same thing? He says, yes, I did. Okay. This is really big news. I think Dylan, why didn't we talk about this? He says, I, I, I don't know. I totally forgot. I spaced out. So I got him back on the line and we addressed what I heard. You asked the question. <laughs> All right, Dylan, Dylan's back again, and, and here's why. So Dylan and I wrapped up, and then I watched the press conference. I had only checked the notes beforehand. We didn't have much time, and the press conference had just wrapped. And I was watching the press conference after Dylan and I got done, and uh, I noticed Dylan asked a question of Ryan Day. And when I heard Ryan Day's answer, I needed to uh, check with Dylan that he got the same impression as I did. So I want to play this for you real quick. Uh, Dylan Davis, Delaware Gazette. Stay with the quarterback series. Devin still firmly in transition back to quarterback right now. Yes, yeah. Going into, into the week, how do you want to like kind of split those reps there? How quickly do you want to get on the field? Yeah. Yeah, we, we've talked about that, Chip and I, about you know as as the season goes on, where do we want to insert him into games? Um, you know, we'll, we'll kind of see how the week plays out but um i probably don't see us doing that in terms of like you know the third series or the first play of the second quarter in this game in particular okay dylan so just to repeat for everybody so it's clear you asked him when does he plan on inserting Devin, who he said was quarterback two and he answered that firmly and quickly that Devin was quarterback two and then he said as the season goes on as the season goes on where do we want to insert him I don't see us doing it in the third series or the first play of the second quarter in this game in particular, but it's something we're considering. Now, 
that almost sounds like a 1A, 1B type of situation with the quarterbacks from the way I'm hearing that. I hadn't thought this was the plan at all. The first play in the second quarter or the third series, like this wasn't anything that, I, that I've heard discussed. Did you take the same thing away from that? I don't know that I would say that it's a, a 1A, 1B situation, It's but what I did take away from it is that it sounds to me like – Again, this is all situationally contingent upon how the game goes, but it sounds to me like, I mean, would I be shocked if Devin Brown played, you know, late in the second quarter or some point in the second quarter if Ohio State got off to a, a good start and, you know, build a, you know, quick 20 to nothing lead or something like that? No, I would not be surprised at that. Not something that I really thought about, you know, you know, going into this week. I didn't think that, that would be the case at all uh, because, you know, you know, for all that's been made about Devin Howard's, Kevin Howard, Will Howard, excuse me, uh, Will Howard's um, experience and how much college football he's played. I mean, he hasn't played at Ohio State, and it's just it's different, obviously, learning a new offense. Whatnot. So those, that time on the field um, and those reps for him is still going to be valuable as he continues to get more and more comfortable um, in the Ohio State offense. So I, I, it's not something I thought about at all, but hearing that and hearing Ryan Day talk about that, um, you know, he said it's not going to be, you know, preordained first series of the second quarter or the third drive of the game it's not going to be you know set you know ahead of time that that's when Devin Brown's coming into the game but the takeaway that I had or at least you know the way I interpreted it was that Devin Brown's going to play earlier than all, probably a lot of people would have would have thought um again and that's so much of that's contingent upon the game do I think that's crazy or does that do I think that makes it like you know like more of like a 1a or 1b or that maybe they're not still entirely sure that Will Howard's their, their their number one quarterback? No, I don't think that at all. I just think that it goes back to what I you know I said earlier with you that I think it's very important that they get you know reps that can be evaluated for Devin Brown because if they think Devin Brown's going to be a big part of you know what they need to do this year where they're going to go then they need to get reps and see what he is because we still don't know that yet. So I just you know I was surprised by it. I think that you know it says a lot more about you know Ryan's you know want to to get reps for Devin um, and be able to evaluate him on that. I don't think it's a 1A, 1B, but certainly it took me by surprise just the way I interpreted it. And it's, I, I guess I'm glad to hear that you took it the same way. I mean, you know, I value your opinion. And um, if you took it the same way, then it wasn't just me reading into it, that, that Devin's going to play probably earlier than, you know, most people thought this, this week. Yeah. I wouldn't have thought that they had had a discussion about putting him in that early. Like that's, that's really early. I was thinking, you know, late in the third quarter would be would be nice to get him in there and get him some real reps. He's talking first half if they're up to uh, up to a big lead, which like you're saying like Will hasn't played any football at Ohio State. Pulling him out in the first half, um yeah, definitely not something I'd considered. All right, buddy, I appreciate you jumping back on with me. I just wanted to double check um that, that you were feeling the same way about that considering you asked the question and somehow we missed talking about that the first time yeah well that just goes to <laughs> that just goes to show you you know coming out of the out of the woody you know we got uh, jim Knowles and we got will howard as well and my brain was just smashed potatoes um you know just with all that information and trying to digest it and then turning around and doing the show so uh, yeah shame on me for not uh, mentioning you know the most important response to uh, the question that I asked, but I'm glad you had me back on so we could get that sorted out. And uh, certainly, as you mentioned, just adds to the intrigue of, uh, of Saturday yeah. we're going to see. Um, so, uh, and just to, you know, to bring it all about, you said, you know, for, you know, it's Akron and, and look, respect to Akron, but, you know, it's a game Ohio State's favored by 50 points to go in. Um, but for a 50 point favorite, you know, in a season opener at home, there's so many talking points and potential storylines to this. So can't wait. Uh, looking yeah. forward to it. Can't wait to hop on with you afterwards and talk about what we saw. All right. Thanks, buddy. Talk to you later. Yep. I don't know if you guys were under this impression, but when I listen to that, and Dylan's right, I, I'm jumping the gun on the 1B scenario. Okay. I, I, he's right. But were you thinking that we were going to be looking at any sort of deal where we're talking like a, a third series? That's the kind of talk that was coming out last year, right? Third series or sometime in the first half at all of, of quarterback two coming in he said they've been talking about it didn't didn't think it would happen this week doesn't mean it won't happen that was surprising that was really surprising to me dylan obviously had the same takeaway we were both pretty surprised by that i haven't seen anybody talking about it uh yet and i think that's definitely newsworthy i'd like to dig in on that with ryan day unfortunately um He's answered all the questions he's going to answer for this week. We'll have to catch up with him on next Tuesday. But we did also get out of the press conference that Chip Kelly will call games from the box, which is 
somewhat different than I thought that was going. It seemed to me like they were setting that up for Chip to be down on the sidelines. And I think most of us can agree. And people ask me a couple of times, like, what do I think of it? And my answer was always like, you know, I'm not Chip Kelly. And um, I think Chip Kelly should call plays exactly where the heck Chip Kelly wants to call plays because he's Chip Kelly and uh, he knows best, right? I'm not going to tell him that it certainly seems to me like Chip, having never called plays from a box, that you would be able to get a better view from the box or it'd be nice to have all your stuff laid out in front of you which is exactly what Ryan Day said today, essentially. It's clean, it's orderly, you can focus on your next play from up in the box. Um, and Chip's going to call from up in the box, but it seemed like that was trending the opposite way. And one of the reasons they gave is it's not such a big deal anymore because with the tablets on the sideline, you're able to go take a look at the formations and such that you weren't able to before and kind of get that overhead view with your tablets, though not in live time like you can in the box. So. I think it will be better in the box. Um, but, you know, then again, if Chip Kelly feels like he gets more in the rhythm on the sideline or what, I don't know. I don't know why he would originally choose to be on the sideline other than he's just used to being on the sideline, right? But he's going to be in the box. I think most people are, are going to be happy about that. Ryan Day also said that it's going to be Chip Kelly in Will's ear. He's going to have access to that receiver as well, but he's going to let Chip do the talking. It also came out that Tegra Shabala has won the right guard spot. So we've got the offensive line set now with Josh Simmons at left tackle, Donovan Jackson at left guard, Seth McLaughlin at center, Tegra Shabala at right guard, and Josh Fryer at right tackle, which means you've got three returning guys and an experienced center. And then Tegra Shabala is your first time first year starter. That's really good. I like the sound of that. Tegra 6'6, 330. An absolute mountain of a man, a road grader who plays with a nasty streak from Ohio. Absolutely love it. I feel for Carson Hinsman, who started last year, kind of a raw deal for him. I mean, it's not a raw deal when you get to start at Ohio State. It's a wonderful privilege. Uh, he played like you'd expect a guy in his second year on the offensive line to play. And that's okay. He's got plenty of time to you know, get better and, and play more. And he just might this year. I don't know that that's, you know, a concrete answer. He might actually play this week quite a bit because it sounds like Ryan Day said it's going to be hot. He said they want to roll players in. And he said that the sickness that went through the offensive line actually helped them build depth by playing guys that were, uh, you know, normally would not have gotten reps with the ones and the twos. They got up and got to play. So they built some depth through that. I do feel for Carson that I think, being sick might have hurt him here. He was the guy who missed out on uh, the most days, more than anybody on the offensive line with that illness that went through. And that's a bummer to lose a battle and have that lingering in the back of your head. What if I didn't get sick and miss those days? So that's a bummer for him. But the offensive line is straight. Have him, a guy with experience of a whole year starting as a backup who can play either center or guard. I like it. I like the sound of it. It looks really good here okay i need for saturday your player to watch and your coach to watch on saturday against akron i started thinking about it and i was like you know people like us you and i who are into this like we are who are we most looking forward to and i, I was thinking like an answer like caden mcdonald and it's just so much like us that we would think of you know not the most obvious answer there is, which is J.J. Smith or Caleb Downs, but we think like it's got to be someone unique. It's got to be someone that makes our friends go, ooh, yeah. <laughs> you know what I mean? No, it's really not that this year. It's just Caleb Downs or J.J. Like, that's just what it is. It's one of those two. Uh, I'll go with J.J. He's who I'm most looking forward to. And what about the coach you're most looking forward to? Um, or most, most looking at, I think, might have been the way it was phrased. And that, to me, I think the answer is Keenan Bailey because the tight ends to me and the way we see these tight ends swap in and out, what he goes with, who starts, I think it'll be Will Kazmarek and 11 personnel. And I think that's probably the proper move until Jelani's ready with the blocking. And the way he rotates these guys in, what we see out of them, I'm really curious to see. 
Keenan Bailey, a guy to me, the jury's still out on, though I'm really happy with his recruiting class this year with Nate Roberts and Brody Lennon. So definitely like feeling better about him than I did, you know, heading into well before he landed those two, but uh, feeling better about that. There's a lot of people getting a little irritated that Jelani's not ready. No, I no, I'm looking around because I'm I'm right there with them. These cousin hires are killing me. Like it becomes apparent. It, it, anytime you have a a position group of question on this roster, it feels like you look around and you're like, hmm, why was he hired? And it's like there's always it's always the same answer. It's someone's buddy. And I feel like when you have a guy like Jelani Thurman, a borderline five star that came in here at what six four six five. 260 by the end of his freshman year that they can't figure out how to get on the field, whether it's off the field issues, whether it is not knowing where he's supposed to be on the field. I've heard people say, oh, quarterback will get killed back there because he misses so many assignments. Well, someone's job should be on the line if you can't get a five-star tight end ready to play and it puts your quarterback's health at risk. But the cousin hire is uh that's, that's a pretty hilarious term. Somebody's buddy. And you know, I don't know if that comes from uh, from Dabo. We talked about him yesterday having seven of his 10 countable coaches being either from the program or kind of pals and buddies. Uh, Keenan Bailey obviously came up through the program. A lot of people call him Ryan Day's like go-to guy. And that's how he ended up coaching the tight ends with no tight end experience, either playing it or coaching it. So. Obviously, when you come into a role like that, you're going to have eyeballs on you, suspicious of the hire. So, you know, I'm not sus I I'm not saying that's why I'm suspicious in watching the tight ends. I'm watching them because looking at the room and the pieces in the room, it's very interesting to see how this is going to be handled. I agree with him about Jelani Thurman. I think he should be ready to go. I think that if you're not gearing up towards that happening by the middle of the season, so he is ready to go towards the end, then you're making a strategic error because when you get to those big time matchup games, I know my buddy Dan hates that phrase. <laughs> um, when you get to those big time matchup games, you need every mismatch you can get and Jelani presents a mismatch. So got to get him ready to roll. Um, Sonny Styles is going to be starting at will. I asked Dylan about a quote that Jim Knowles had, which is he considers Sonny, CJ Hicks, and Cody all three starters. Ryan Day said Sonny was the starter, uh, and there's been some separation there. So let's get to the interview with Dylan, go through that. We'll come back when we're done and go over some recruiting goods because we got a, a juicy story here and the take on the, the, the stallion stock. And joining us again, Dylan Davis from the Delaware Gazette. We had a couple of press conferences today. Ryan Day, Jim Knowles, and Will Howard all talk. Dylan's coming to talk to us about it. And Dylan, it sounds like we have got a starter at right guard who has been announced. Yeah, uh, Tager's the guy. I think everybody thought that was going to be the case going into that mock uh, game that they had on Saturday. Um, so it sounds like Tabor's the guy. Ryan did mention that they're going to roll guys in there, um, which is going to be the case at a lot of positions, you know, frankly, because – a, obviously it's the opener and you hope that things go well. They're going to win that game comfortably. So you're going to want to get plenty of guys in there and be with the heat. Um, you know, they're going to want, they're going to keep guys fresh. Um, you know, yeah. like it's going to be a hot one on Saturday and uh, you know, not that's any excuse or anything, but that's reality. So they're going to be rolling a lot of guys, but uh, yeah, right guard, you're going to see a few different bodies in there, but Tegra's are in the right. And man, I just love that for Tegra. Um, Tegra is such a nice, you know, soft spoken kid. Um, and yeah. uh, I'm just really, I'm really happy for him that he has a chance to go out and be a starter for the, you know, the Ohio state Buckeyes and you know, a kid who's from Cincinnati area and grew up a Buckeye fan. I and mean, you know, what an honor. So excited for Tegra. Yeah. Really cool. And he also said that, Due to the illness, they, uh, you know, they built some depth with some of the guys who weren't out and Tegra was kind of a rock throughout that. So that's really nice to hear about Tegra and I'm really happy for him. Um, Sonny, he also said that he's going to be starting week one. Uh, Jim Knowles said that he considers Sonny, CJ and Cody all ones. And he said they should play equally. That's surprising. I hadn't heard that. Um, Laurenitis had said that, you know, he was going to go with the hot hand. If he had four or five, he was going to play four or five. And it seems like with Arvell and Gabe that we're going to see quite a bit of all these guys. 
Yeah. I think with CJ, I think when, when Jim said that, what it kind of told me was what we kind of already knew that like the way that they're going to get CJ on the field, the different ways they're going to use him is that while he might not be, you know, your starter at will per se, like with the different things they're going to do with him, he's going to be on the field a lot with Sonny, you know, and with Cody. Um, and so in that sense that he's still a starter uh, again, might not be, you know, if they, if they come, if they, if they come out on the field with that base four, two, five look, and there's only two linebackers on the field, it's going to be Sonny and Cody. But for, you know, the amount of times that they're going to have different looks with three linebackers on the field or even just rotating out with Sonny um, as well, um, you know, CJ is going to play plenty of starter level reps on Saturday. And that's not a surprise. Um, and then I hope we get to see. I mean, I, I hope, you know, we always we always hear them talking about rotating these guys and whatnot. And certainly game the game flow dictates all that. Um, again, we would expect that Saturday's game will be. You know, it, it better be in hand, you know, fairly early on where they can they can do that. But, uh, you know, I hope that we get to see Gabe Powers. I hope we get to see Arbel, um, certainly um, guys on there, because, um, you know, as, as the season progresses, you know, you don't know how much you're going to see of those guys. So you, they've got to get those reps now. And that extends to every position. You know, that's a conversation that, you know, I wish I could, you know, you could have candidly with, you know, Ryan Day or some of these mm -hmm. coordinators. Because, like, you know, Ryan Day with those quarterbacks needs to get those guys on the field now, Saturday. Like, find a way to do it. Like, find, you know, I know you don't want to predetermine them, but find a way to do it because, you know, you don't know that those reps are going to come down the road. So get them while you can. Um, but at linebacker, certainly, I think we're going to see a, a good handful of them. Maybe even see, you know, my guy from Big Walnut, Garrett Stover, get just, you know, a few snaps just to get uh, just to get that out of the way. Uh, maybe we'll see. Shout out Big Walnut. <laughs> um he mentioned about this depth playing it. He said there's been a – I was just reading the transcript, so I didn't get to watch it yet. But he said something about a philosophical change when it comes to playing the depth. And, you know, I was talking about Urban Meyer's comments about how talented this team is um, last week. And, you know, my thought was people were comparing it to 2019. In 2019, if you're just going, you know, starter for starter, you know, maybe 19 is better. But when you look at the depth on this team, that's where it makes all the difference. Because of all the seniors returning, you've got ready-made starters, guys that we just listened to Larry Johnson say that he calls Caden Curry and Kenyatta Jackson ones as well. You know, you got ones that are backups now. I wonder if that philosophical change is maybe rolling more. And, I, and I'm looking more at the defensive line here, rolling those guys in more early. Um, what, what did you take away from those comments about the philosophical change about the depth? Well, uh, I'd be remiss if I didn't say that one of the first things I thought about when talking about that philosophical change or what's shifted is, well, what's what's changed in the college football landscape overall? Um, and it's the transfer portal. Um, mm -hmm. And it's, it's, the, it's the prevalence of people, you know, hopping in the portal um, and seeking the opportunity to play early right away, which obviously is, you know, well within their right. And, and I understand it and get it and whatnot. So my first thought, maybe it's not you know, maybe it's not, the, you know, the first thing, second or third thing, but just it was my thought that, you know, it's, it's important to get these guys on the field and get them engaged and, and involved um, and, and and let them, you know, kind of make a name for themselves or at least start to make a name for themselves um, and show them that, like, you know, you're a part of this program. Like, you know, there's a path to you being a significant contributor at Ohio State, um, you know, and um, so there was that. But, uh, you know, also I just think with the – with the – the extension of the season and how long this season could be as well. I think that's also part of it as well. Like you can't afford to not know what you have behind some of these guys, you know, in the ways maybe you couldn't afford it. You, you can't really afford that in other seasons either, but especially now because, um, you know, one of the things I'm most interested in seeing this year is just how much, you know, of an emphasis they put on, getting as many guys in the game as possible because we've heard so much, you know, throughout the off season, they're like, well, it's a long season. We're going to need everybody. And, you know, that also, that sounds well and fine, you know, uh, up front, but then when, you know, the game start and, and you've got to, you know, find time for those guys, are you actually going to do it and whatnot? And I'm curious to see, like, you know, it, it, do these coaches really, you know, firmly believe that whole mantra of it's going to take everybody because if they do, then they're going to get these guys in there. Um, you're going to have to, because you can't afford to not know what you have in some of these guys. If you truly believe that it's going to take everybody or, or you're, if you want to roll these guys to keep guys fresh and, you know, have them last, you know, for the, uh, for the duration of this, you know, long race that potentially if they're going to go win a national title. So, you know, there's a couple of those things that I, that I thought of as well, to be honest with you, I never understood. I don't understand why it took a philosophical change because it just, uh, you know, you know, in my, in my opinion, and I, I, I always go, it goes back to the quarterback situation. You know, it just, it's always just driven me crazy 
the lack of, you know, snaps that these quarterbacks see behind, you know, the starter or even the backup, you know, when, when especially now when you have more um, of a runway before you have to talk about red shirts with some of these younger guys, like why, right. why not? And not only that, but like when they do get in there, they hand the football off twice and you, you, you can't glean anything from that. You get nothing on tape. The whole point of putting them in there. So you have film to evaluate, but you can't evaluate it, you know, a couple of handoffs. And so I've never understood that in, in the first place. Um, so in terms of the, the change, I don't, I, I can't tell you why it took a change. Um, mm -hmm. I can only speculate that there are a couple of things that's happened in college football that would, you know, suggest that you can't afford to not find out about these guys early on. So. Yeah, I think you're spot on A lot of it does have to do with the portal. And honestly, I think that they've been, kind of setting that up with what they've been saying all off season, like guys stick with us. We're all going to play. It's a long season, you know, letting them know everybody's going to be involved this year. But to your point, I I've been saying that for, for quite a while. Number one, old habits die hard. We'll mm -hmm. see how much they really mean it by game six or seven uh, when they talk about playing this depth. And number two, don't put them in. If you're just going to shut the offense down, it means absolutely nothing. You've got to keep the pedal to the metal. You got to let the young guys run the actual offense you're going to be running in the game to see what they got. And we heard Ryan Day say today that he wants this team to look like the hardest playing team in the country. This week, I've kind of been on the last couple of years. We've not seen much fire from this team. And we know this team's got great leadership. Some of the best leaders are also kind of quiet type leaders. I think this year we got some bold guys on this team. I want to see some fire for out of these guys. And I think we got it. We got IGB, uh, Brandon Ennis, Carnell Tate is even, you know, in a, in a quiet way, just kind of a smack talker. Like, I want to see some attitude out of these guys. And I think we're going to get it this year because of the scraps we've been seeing in practice, the DBs and the wide receivers going at it. There just seems like there's a different attitude with these guys. Look, if you talk about, you know, obviously the talent has to be there and it is there. Um, going back to your previous comments and something I've said before that I kind of got a little bit of pushback on. I think this is from top to bottom Ohio State's best roster, um, you know, uh, that they've had since Ryan Day's been there. Um, and again, at the top, maybe that 2019 team, you know, can go, you know, blow for blow with that team just from top to bottom right. in the chart. I think this is the best team Ryan Day's had. Um, so the, the talent's there and whatnot. But, you know, if Ohio State doesn't find that edge, you know, that proverbial edge that everybody talks about that they can't find that edge to them um you know i i don't know that this team is a whole lot different than some of the other great football teams maybe not quite as talented from top to bottom that but i don't know that they're a whole lot different than you know other other teams that ryan Day's had that fell short uh, this team has to has to find that edge and i don't know what that looks like i don't know how you quantify that or i don't know what you know what that tangible edge looks like and whatnot but to your point if they don't you know, if they don't have that nasty streak, if they're if everything they've talked about this offseason about why these guys came back and falling short and not meeting their goals and whatnot, if you can't see that play out on the field in terms of you know the way they care themselves and you know the, the fire that they play with or you know you know you know playing with their hair on fires, or you know Ryan would say, mm -hmm. uh, um, you know if that doesn't happen, then I don't I don't understand you know what we've heard for month after month you know in this offseason about you know this this team and you know and it's it's singular focus on going and winning a national championship so and obviously there's a fine line to that you can't do something stupid out there you can't right. play with a top emotion and get caught in bad spots put your team in a bad spot but uh if, if you if you can't notice it I, I don't understand what we've been listening to for the, for the last few months well the it just reminds me just right now when you're saying that the florida state fans are all mad that they feel they've been sold a bill yeah. of goods by the coaching staff yeah, exactly. by the guys covering the team <laughs> Look, i hope that's not the case here I mean, I, I don't, you know, obviously on, on the on the eve of kicking off the season, I don't want to, you know, start to talk about the bad stuff. But, you know, if, if something were to happen this season and it falls apart um, and this team doesn't look any, you know, much different than, you know, what it has. And again, with other teams that, that fell short, um, it's going to be bad enough as it is, obviously, because everybody knows what, what you know, it's national championship or bust for Ohio State. It's, it's going to be in Michigan, winning Big Ten, going to a national championship. Anything short of it, it's just it's, that's not going to be good enough. But if they in, in the process of falling short of that, if they just look like, you know, the same Ohio State teams that, you know, we've seen um, under Ryan Day, I mean, it's going to make a bad situation just even even worse. Um, because, again, to your point about, you know, Florida State fans, you know, all Ohio State fans have been told all offseason is that this team's different. They've got an edge to them. The leadership's there. Uh, they're pissed off. They're hungry. Um, they all came back to to, to, to achieve, um, you know, what, what they've failed to do so so far. Mm -hmm. um, so, I mean, if, 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 if they fall short of that and it looks just like it always has, uh, man, that's – that's going to be pretty bad. Chip Kelly is going to be in the box. This is something that they've kind of been back and forth on. 
Today, Ryan Day sounded kind of definitive on it. Um, you know, it's hard to get your next series ready when you're on the sideline. Uh, it's easier to stay organized and keep things clean when you're up in the box. And before Chip was talking about, you know, being on the field and he even referenced a play when he was on the field with Ryan Day as the quarterback where he could see Ryan was a little dinged up. Uh, so he knew not to call anything physical for him on the next play. He said you can't see that from the box. Um, but it sounded pretty definitive today. So Chip is going to be in the box, and he said a couple other guys are going to be in the box with him. Do you recall who he mentioned? Yeah, um, Tim Drebno for sure, um, which is a guy that Chip Kelly has a, a lot of experience with, or a decent amount of experience with anyways. He was Chip's offensive line coach out of UCLA. Um, so, and, and Tim has offensive coordinator experience, um, a ton of offensive line experience, um, you know, as a um, – you know, as a, as a coach there, um, just for whatever that's worth, right. if they were ever looking for an offensive line coach down the line. Um, and uh, so, but, uh, um, so he's going to be up there with them. I forget, um, um, I think, um, I can't remember who the other two are, but anyways, um, so, but Tim Drebno is going to be up there. I think that's the big one uh, for sure. Um, and I love, I love, I love the decision. Um, you know, there are certainly things that you can get, you can clean being down on the sideline that you can't right. get from being in the press box, as Chip mentioned, um, without a doubt. Uh, but just in general, if you're calling an offense, I love the thought of being up in the box because of what Ryan said about being able to, you know, immediately review a, a, a series, um, you know, see what you liked, what you didn't like, you know, what what the defense was doing, and then automatically, you know, just start going on to the next one. Um, and sometimes when you're down on the on the sideline, you just your your attention gets diverted to other things, you know, just because naturally the, you know, the, the chaos is uh, of a sideline. So um, to be up there and just be solely focused on, you know, what just happened in this drive um, and, and what you want to do in the next drive, I think is is certainly the best thing for uh, Chip and that Ohio State offense. So I was really happy to hear that. Again, that there are reasons that. You you would want to be on the sideline. Um, and I think there are certain position, you know, certain positions or certain roles where it is more important for you to be on the sideline. Like, like my offensive line coach certainly obviously right. need him on the sideline, you know, yeah. but from a coordinator standpoint, I want both those guys up uh, up in the box because, um, again, you, you, you can see better. Um, you can see the whole field and then how, how, how things develop. Um, and then certainly your focus can go straight to the, the next possession, whereas sometimes that just doesn't happen on the sideline because there's just so much going on down there. So was there any talk about the helmet communications today? A ton. Yeah. Oh, really? about, yeah. I don't know about three or four different questions to all. Um, um, well, I guess to Ryan and to Will Howard as well. Um, a lot of talk about it. Um, look, at the end of the day, nobody knows how this is going to go. I think everybody would be, you know, in, in agreement that, that that it's a good thing. Um, it's, it's a good thing for college football. Not forget, you know, the, some of the reasons why it's happening like, all of a sudden, mm -hmm. but just in general, um, it's long overdue. Um, but nobody knows how it's going to, how it's going to go. Um, I would like to, you know, I'd love to hear Ryan's thoughts on like what the, what the backup plans are, because he mentioned, you know, they're still trying to work through some things like what, what if it goes down, you know, what if it goes down um, and it shuts off at 15 seconds. Right. So what if you're late getting the play and you think about a delay right. of game, like, you know, you got to get the play in. Well, now you've really got to get the play in because af after 15 seconds and that communication uh, line shuts down, then what do you do? I'm just curious what the, what, 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 what would they do? If like, you know, if Will Howard looks at the sideline and says like, Hey, no, you know, it's past 15 seconds. We got to get a play in. So like, do they go back to signal it in real quick? Like, I, I'm just curious about that. And those are all things that we won't see until, you know, it happens. But uh, yeah, there was a ton of talk about the communication system um, and just getting used to it. Uh, but uh, it sounds like everybody um, is excited for it. And then it has a, a lot of benefits, but still there are going to be some kinks to work out. And uh, one of those things that I'm curious about is, you know, are we going to get a, you know, are we are we going to see a delay up game? Uh, because you know it was after 15 seconds, and then you know you see Will Howard looking up like I I I can't hear now. So then then they don't know what to do. So we'll see. I would I would assume you know for for um, as much time as they've had to prepare for it, that they have those contingency plans in place. But uh, uh, now obviously, if the communication line goes down altogether, that's that's something that you know I don't I don't know what they would do after that. I, I guess you just go back to huddling up and running the play in from the sideline like you did in the old days. You know. Um, yeah. But, uh, yeah. No, it's curious. definitely going to be interesting to see how they work that out. There's going to definitely be some kinks, right? I mean, sure, sure. Some, some stuff they're not thinking about till they get out there and actually do it. Talking about Will Howard, uh, Chip was talking about him, I think, last week, and he just kind of mentioned briefly, he called him the run game coordinator. And that was asked about today and elaborated on. Can you explain the answer to that? What, what exactly he meant by that? Yeah, so um, obviously with Chip's offense um, in, in the past, there's a ton of read game to that for the quarterback. The quarterback has a lot put on his plate in terms of um, running that read game. So when he talks about run game coordinator, um, you know, Ryan alluded to this. Um, he was asked about it, and he alluded to it today that, uh, you know, 
he's got to manage that. He's got to manage, you know, reading defensive ends, when's to keep the ball, when to hand the ball off. And then there's, you know, RPO stuff, you know, you know, um, throws out of that as well. Um, and then just checking to the right play in general, you know. Um, so, it, you know, it, do, do they have the right, you know, run called? Uh, um, and so, or, or, or maybe they don't run the football at all. So just, you know, a, a lot of those, a lot of those things. But I think a big part of that and kind of the way I took it when he first said it was in the read game, like when you, you know, you, he has to, he, he, he has the key to, you know, so much of the, you know, all the plays they're going to call in that run game because there's going to be a lot of reads to it. And he's got to make, you know, good reads. I, I, you know, I, everybody talked about CJ running the football more um, when he was there. But if you looked at a lot of the times, like, like there were a lot of times, the few times that he did try to run the football, he pulled the ball back and run and it was the wrong read. It was the wrong read. Yeah. Should have ball off there. It was frustrating because like everybody's like, well, run the ball, CJ. And then like when he, the times he did, it was the wrong read, you know? Um, so, uh, you know, that, that, that's, that's a huge part of it. I don't care who you have back there. I don't care if you have Justin Fields back there or Michael Bick or whoever, if you make the wrong read on that and the defensive end just standing there waiting for you, good luck. Um, so, right. You know, so uh, I think that's a big part of it is just, is, is making the right reads because there's going to be a lot of, it's going to be a read heavy, um, you know, element to that offense. Um, and then, like I said, just being in the, in the right place, um, um, which is something every quarterback has to do. But uh, um, yeah. yeah, it's exciting. I'm excited to watch all the reads. I mean, this is going to be just a, a different experience watching this offense work. And uh, we're just a couple of days away. A couple, couple more and then I'll get you out of here. Yeah, um, yeah. Any other takeaways from Will Howard's talk? I haven't asked you much about Will. Yeah, I was just really struck by um, how how much Will is enjoying the moment um he you, you can tell in his responses and there were certainly a ton of questions today just about his thoughts and what he's feeling emotionally you know getting ready for his first start at ohio state um and you just i'm really taking you know I, my big, biggest takeaway when you know in talking to will is that he's just truly enjoying the moment he appreciates where he's at um and certainly he knew what he was getting into when he came here you know he he understood right. why he was going to ohio state he wanted to develop as a passer to play in the nfl and he wanted to go try to win a national championship and play for you know you know and be a buckeye and everything that comes with that so um you know and then all the questions today you could just tell that he's genuinely enjoying where he's at and that he appreciates it and he's truly excited like there's a, there's a legitimate you know excitement there for him to just to go experience what it means to be a buckeye and you know and and seeing that in all of its glory when he runs out the tunnel um and everything so um i didn't get a chance to ask him i wanted to you know i want to ask him if anybody's prepared him for what that means after games when everybody's dissecting every little thing that he did in that game um you know <laughs> i understand the excitement now but i hope he's ready for what that means you know post game um but uh but i'm sure somebody's probably or he's probably already heard enough of it now just in the quarterback battle in the camp you know in camp people trying to break down clips of you know the highlight reels that the that the team puts up and whatnot so he probably understands what's coming but uh yeah, yeah no, i was just uh that, that was my biggest takeaway that uh, he seems like he's genuinely excited um to to to, to be a buckeye um and, and be the starting quarterback at ohio state and, and everything that comes with that um so and i think look will he hasn't shot away from talking about the talent gap between where he's came from and where he's at now. Right. Um, and, and I, and, and I don't want to say, cause he, 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 he was clear today too, that he's not trying to put down the guys that he, you know, played with at Kansas state mm -hmm. because he's played, he played with some players there uh, for, for sure. Um, he played with some good guys there and whatnot, but uh, he also seems like he's just, you know, truly excited to play with that level of talent. Who wouldn't be that? There's nothing wrong with saying, saying that um, look, there, there's no arguing that there's a, difference in talent level from top to bottom at Ohio State yep. and Kansas State, right? Um, and which quarter, what quarterback wouldn't want to, you know, to, to, to be inserted into that offense and have those guys at his disposal. Um, now it puts more pressure on his plate to like, hey, you better go perform now. You know, you better go perform with all that, um, you know, because there there are no excuses now. Uh, but, uh, but I think he's genuinely excited to have all that talent at his disposal as well. And, and who wouldn't be? Yeah, I saw that he also said that he's trying to, or, or he's being encouraged to make tougher throws than he yeah. was yeah. at Kansas State. That's, that's actually kind of, sorry, yeah, go to, ahead. That, yeah. to that talent point, you know, because yeah. these guys can make plays for you. Let let them, you know, give them an opportunity here. And that 50-50 ball all of a sudden is not so much of a 50-50 ball. Yeah. Um Ryan Day said, and again, I'm just reading this so I didn't hear his tone. Devin Brown is going to be the number two this week. Um reading that, I don't know. When he said this week is you are you thinking this is not set in the stone right now? So I was, I actually asked him about that. Um, and, uh, you know, he said, 
I, I kind of I started asking him, is Devin entrenched? And he he entrenched as your as your backup, and he didn't bat an eye. Just you know, I hadn't even finished the question. He's like, yeah, yes, he is. So okay. it seems like it seems like that's pretty solid that Devin's Devin's the guy. Um, I think Ryan's maybe more so than other years been very careful to continue to say like this week, this week, you know, and I don't know if that's by design or, you know, just, you know, just a coincidence or whatnot, but for a lot of different positions and whatnot, he's, he's been very careful to say like, yeah, this week or, you know, against Akron or for week one, the opener or whatever. Um, so, but, but I think from what the, from the tone that I got, um, Devin is definitely that number two guy. Um, okay. You know, and then Ryan said he doesn't know how much because my question was how, you know, how quickly does Devin get on the field? Um, you know, because, again, going back to, you know, getting these guys reps and whatnot, Devin Brown has next to no experience playing at Ohio State, next to none whatsoever. He's your backup quarterback. He's your backup quarterback. Um, and, and if you're going to sit there and tell me that, you know, it's going to take all of them. And he's been a, he, he's especially said that about quarterbacks all year, which I've. I roll my eyes every time I hear it because it's, it better not take all of them. Like, yeah, everybody wants to talk about the Cardell Jones situation. Um, Come and, on, and, now. and look, that, that was that was truly that's what made that situation so special. It was truly one of a kind. Uh, yeah. it, it, it might not ever happen again, so it better not take all those quarterbacks. Um, but you know, it might take two. You know, obviously, backup quarterbacks are thrust yeah. in games all the time, and so you know, I asked how quickly he's going to get Devin on the field uh, because Devin needs time. He needs time on the field. He needs film to evaluate, um, and you need to know what you have in him too. Because oh, by the way, make no mistake about it, Julian saying is coming. So he needs. Ryan Day needs to know what he has in Devin Brown because if they go to Austin on October 12th and they're down 13 to three at halftime and things are not going well and the offense is clunky or just downright bad and whatnot, and you think maybe you have to make a change at quarterback in order to go win that football game and keep everything that you want to do, uh, you know, in line and whatnot, he's going to have to make a decision about who gives him the best chance to, to, to come from behind in Austin Stadium at night and go do that. Is it Devin Brown? Well, he sure as heck better have some film to go off of early in the season because as of right now, he has no idea how Devin Brown would react in that situation. And even then, he still might not know because getting, you know, first half reps against Akron and, you know, playing in the second half of a game in Oregon that you're down in and you have to make plays down the field in the past game to go win um, two entirely different things. But you better at least have some game, you know, game reps to, to, to evaluate. Um, so so I asked him, you know, how quickly he's going to get Devin on the field. His answer was predictable. He's not really sure. You know, it sounds like he understands that, you know, I know he understands. It sounds like he wants to get him in fairly early, but there's no set plan for, hey, he's going to play the third drive of the game or he's going to start the right. second quarter or anything like that. Um, but uh, I was certainly curious about that because he better get those he better get those reps in. Um, and, and hey, look, to that point, I want to ask him a follow up, but I'm not Tim May, so I only get one question. I don't get three questions at a time. Um, so uh, I want to ask him the follow up. Who would the third quarterback be? Just out of curiosity, who's the third quarterback off the bench? If you can play three on Saturday, Ryan, who's that going to be? I think we all know who, you know, it should be or probably going to be even. Um, but just so I would like, I'm curious to hear what he said. And to that point, okay, you better get both those guys because, again, if that if, if that comes to pass and you have to make that decision in a game where you don't have time to evaluate or think about it and talk to your staff about it, it's got to be a halftime decision or even an in-game decision. You better have something to go off of. Um, and right now they have nothing to go off on of those guys. So I'm curious to yeah. see how they, how they handle that. Yeah, I was on the morning roast yesterday with uh, with my buddies in that, this conversation. Who Who is the third quarterback to uh, to throw a pass in the Akron game? We're kind of all the mindset, all in the mindset that we are going to see a, a third quarterback against the Akron game or yeah. against Akron, um, and I kind of hope we do. And I, I think it's going to be Julian, but there's also a school of thought. You know, next year quarterback really room really young. You, you want Lincoln to stick around if possible, yeah. and you're going to want to show him some love here and there. Um, so we'll see. But I'll tell you what. Just based on the circumstances, for for as garbage as the opponent is, and I hate saying that as an Akron guy, yeah, <laughs> for yeah. as garbage as the opponent is, this is the most intriguing opening day I can ever remember. I mean, th this game has so much intrigue. We have so many questions. I listed my top 10 questions the other day, and I, I could have kept going. I had 10, like, serious questions. Like, this is what I want to see, and it, it started off with five. Just kept on rolling. There is so much to look forward to. I can't wait. I can't wait to talk to you after the game yeah. where Dylan is going to join us on the post game show at Juck on Bucks. I'm going to come on probably three, four minutes left in the fourth quarter, get the show rolling. He'll go to the press conference, join us afterwards. Come join us on Saturday. We'll see you then. Thanks, guys. Thanks, buddy. All right. 
Dylan's the best, man. Love having that guy on. I'm so appreciative that he always comes on to assist us with the uh, the word from the Woody. You know, really nice to be able to have that insight from him. Who Listen, Dylan's a Buckeye fan like us. Season tickets since he was four years old. Gets out of the press conference and, uh, you know, calls his dad to talk about what he heard. Like, they're Buckeyes. And that is important to me because he knows where I'm coming from when I ask him questions. Like, he knows where we're coming from. And he is every bit as fiery as we are off the air. Um, and, and I just absolutely love that dude. So, oh, 49 Buckeyes made, uh, made NFL rosters this year. Obviously a huge number. And the way this is spread out, just looking at this, like these guys could be their own team, the Buckeyes in the NFL. At quarterback, you've got C.J. Stroud and Justin Fields. Running back, J.K. Dobbins. Zeke Elliott and Trey Sermon. Wide receiver, they're loaded. Marvin Harrison, Terry McLaurin, Chris Olave, Jackson Smith and Jigba, Garrett Wilson, Curtis Samuel. Tight end, Luke Farrell and Jeremy Ruckert. Cade Stover and Nick Vanette. Offensive tackle, Taylor Decker, Paris Johnson, Dewan Jones, Thayer Munford, Nicholas Petit Frere. Guard, Jonah Jackson and Michael Jordan. Center, Josh Myers. Defensive end, the Boza brothers, Zach Harrison, Sam Hubbard, Draymond Jones, and Chase Young. Defensive tackle, Big Hank, Cameron Hayward, still getting it done. Davon Hamilton, Tyquan Lewis, linebacker Jerome Baker, Baron Browning, Jonathan Cooper, Tommy Eichenberg, Malik Harrison, Raquan McMillan, and Pete Werner. Cornerback, Marshawn Lattimore, Jeff Okuda, and Denzel Ward. Safety, Von Bell, Jordan Fuller, Ronnie Hickman, Malik Hooker. Punter, Cam Johnston. Long snapper, Liam McCullough. That list the Saints and Seahawks each have four former Buckeyes and guys who just got cut in this final roster cut. Noah Brown from the Texans. Paris Campbell, my hometown boy from my high school, uh, got cut from the Eagles. Xavier Johnson got cut from the Bills. Wyatt Davis got cut from the Browns. Jamarco Jones got cut from the Lions. Matt Jones got cut from the Dolphins. Jalen Holmes got cut from the Jets. Tommy Togiai got cut from the Falcons. Tyreek Smith from the Cardinals. Kendall Sheffield from the Jets. Sean Wade from the Patriots. Josh Proctor from the Jaguars. And Tanner McAllister from the Broncos. All right, let me hit this Stallions thing. This will be fast. Um, lied to the NCAA about being on the Central Michigan sidelines. Said he made plenty of money selling, buying and selling tickets. Claims that he never used footage to advance scout, but admits that people sent him footage from tickets that he bought and they went to the game, sent him the footage. And he said it was like an aunt giving you a Christmas present that you already own. And you're just like, you know, thanks. I have it already. Remember there were 58 separate instances of this, according to the NCAA of just friends sending him Christmas gifts that he already has in the form of a video. He claims that he did not use any advanced scouting to be good at this. He was just better than everybody because of his organization. In one clip, one of the few based in reality, the NCAA is interviewing him and his lawyer says to those lawyers, this pompous lawyer, says if they were trying to do any real investigation, they should be investigating Ohio State because they believe that that's where this information came from. The information they're talking about is Connor Stallions, whatever information was in his uh, email that had the spreadsheet that led them down this investigation that was hand delivered to the NCAA. I don't care who did that. Like, I could not care less. It doesn't change the fact that the NCAA had this information and the information led them to this. So, like, whatever. Does it really matter? It's a totally separate thing. Sure, prosecute whoever did that for whatever they did but you still got the information and it didn't change. They then asked the NCAA, did they get it from Ohio State? The NCAA says, we're not prepared to answer that. We're not sharing our information with you. And the lawyer then abruptly ends the meeting. By ending that interview, I assume that's where the NCAA says they failed to cooperate. But I was told beforehand that Connor Stallions didn't cooperate because they asked him to do something that nobody would do. That didn't come out if there was something truly that nobody would do that uh, he didn't do, and that's why he got hit with that. 
certainly looked like they just ended that meeting. I don't know if there's more to it, but there was nothing that exonerated or backed up that claim. The entire thing is filled with Michigan honks. I mean, obviously you got his parents, his friends, but the media folks they use, Rich Eisen, prominently featured, obviously angry Rich Eisen, a Michigan grad. That guy cannot control himself when it comes to Ohio State. It's embarrassing. It sounds like Desmond Howard. Dan Wetzel, who's from Connecticut, but lived in Michigan as long as I've known him as a journalist. Nicole Auerbach from The Athletic, now at NBC, a Michigan grad. Isaiah Hole, the host of Locked On Wolverines and self-proclaimed friend of Connor Stallions. Dave Portnoy from Barstool Sports, of course, a Michigan grad from Boston. There were two journalists who offered a counterpoint. One was from Detroit, and this guy must have been a Michigan State guy because it was just dripping off him how much he hated Michigan and the Michigan man concept and everything about him. So it kind of lacked credibility if you're watching from an honest observer's point of view. And the other guy, they discredited by saying that Ryan Day was in his college class, like they were in class, not a class together, but in the same class at college. So they discredited both of the journalists that offered a counterpoint. Uh, you know, it wasn't a puff piece, but it was certainly made to look sympathetic to Stallions, who was grandiose and arrogant and at the same time wanted to play the victim. Both proud of himself and felt bad for himself and wanted you to feel bad for him. It was pretty gross, man. It was pretty gross. Uh, the one counterpoint from, a, from, from someone from Ohio was a fella named Brohio. He's a message board hero, apparently. Um, also a guy who, who thinks he's a little more important than he is. And he uh, was dressed like this. Brohio, Ohio State fan. How did you become a fan of Ohio State football? He said he was baptized in it. And he lurks around message boards, was very proud of himself that some of the theories that he dug up, I think he was involved in, in digging up the Uncle T stuff, which I don't believe that guy had anything to do with it after all. But the fact that beat writers were picking up on some of the theories that him and some pals were digging up on uh, 11W message boards really made him proud of himself. Why in the world? Anyone would interview a message board guy who's not even going like, look at how this guy's dressed. Like they're just making this look like a joke. It's so transparent. Bro, Ohio, the Ohio state fan that could be stallions under there for all I know. Anyway, he was really proud of himself. Stallions really proud of himself. He absolutely did not apologize and said he would do it all again. I'm curious to find out, does the NCAA really have evidence? of these 58 games that were advanced scouted that he sent people to, because I honestly going into this didn't think that that was going to be something that he adamantly denied. Um, because if they really have proof of that, like whatever, you can't believe anything this guy says. And if they actually did that, or he actually did that, whether anybody else was involved or not, all the people who go around saying, Everybody shares these signs. Everybody has these signs. Okay, fair enough. If you could just explain to me one time, and I've still not heard anybody explain a plausible reason why you would go through the aggravation and spend the money for the 50 yard line seats, 58 different games, sending people to go do it that obviously I don't know how much they're making to do it, but they're getting something out of the gig 58 times to keep this meticulous database, to get these videos if it didn't present a serious advantage, right? If you can explain that to me, maybe it all was for nothing. Uh, but they certainly weren't having fun. And I don't know what extra was attained by doing that than these other folks had that were passing around sheets, but it certainly had to be something. So this all hinges on can the NCAA prove that they actually did go do this at 58 games? If they can, th th it's it, man. You're cooked. You're done. And I just can't wait to read what's in this actual notice of allegations. One of the things, oh my gosh, the manifesto. Okay, so he talks about his stupid manifesto. 
it shows this graph, right, of the United States. And it's got, you know, all these color codes. And he's telling the producer, this is where all the recruits came from and, and blah, blah, blah. And he says, people ask, can I see your manifesto? No, you're not seeing the manifesto. Look at his face. Look at this guy's face. Look at how proud he is of his work. I'm not going to give you the manifesto. And you know why he's got this smirk and why he doesn't want to show anybody the manifesto? Because he thinks he's going to coach again. He absolutely thinks he's going to be a college coach again. He's saving the manifesto for when he does, probably keeping it updated. He has no idea that he will never coach college football again. He thinks that his volunteer defensive coordinator position out of high school is his door back in. In fact, he's actually coaching now and not just doing some grunt work because he couldn't coach football, which is the truth. It's pretty pathetic. He definitely had a skill. I appreciate his drive and his determination and his love for Michigan. He had this plan to get on to the Michigan football staff that started when he was in high school, looking up what most coaches had in common. And the answer was they served in the military. And that's what sent him to the military academy. Went there with that goal. Goes to a Jim Harbaugh seminar. Ask Gary Partridge, the Michigan linebacker who got fired during this scandal for telling students or players to lie to protect the coaches. He goes up to him and asks him, can he come volunteer? He says, yes. This guy got himself into the Michigan program. It's pretty impressive. He, the, the, the track he took, it really is. As far as deciphering the codes and doing everything in the organization, it's impressive. It is. All of it is. It's just scummy and sleazy, but none of that's illegal. It's only illegal when you do the advanced scouting because, and they can say it till they're blue in the face. Yes, it is an advantage if he did it 58 times. It is an advantage or nobody would be dumb enough to do that and waste all that time and spend all that money. I can't tell you exactly what the advantage is. He can, he won't. He's not even copying to doing the advanced scouting. The NCAA will have the final word on that. They say 58 times it happened. He says he was buying and selling tickets, giving some to his mom. All right, we'll see. But I can tell you this. Dave Portnoy called him the perfect Michigan man. In fact, Connor Stallions, a big fan of Bo Schembechler, early on in the documentary, he cites his the team, the team, the team speech, which quite honestly, one of my favorite sports speeches of all time. It's tremendous. Even though it's Bo's, it's fantastic. I wonder if this dude has ever asked his slimy self what Bo Schembechler would think of him because it's not positive. And I think Dave Portnoy is actually right. Connor Stallions is the perfect Michigan man. So is Dave Portnoy because that's what a Michigan man is today. Bo Schembechler's era, it was not. They held themselves to a higher standard. Now you've got morons like this. I don't know what I did two and a half years ago in COVID either. If you ask me right now some of the things that I did during COVID, I would not be able to tell you. So if he didn't remember the events of the accusations, I'm going to go with that. He didn't remember. He misremembered, like Ryan and Mike said. So with that being said, Harbaugh won that situation, and NCAA is pissed. NCAA has always had a hard on for Michigan because Michigan never needed the NCAA. NCAA has always had a hard on for Michigan because Michigan never needed the NCAA. I'm not quite so sure he understands what the NCAA is. Expound, Braylon. To play dirty like the SEC, we didn't have to play dirty. Like that. We didn't have to play dirty like the SEC. We didn't have to play dirty like the ACC. We didn't have to do like SMU did back in the day. We never needed to lean on the NCAA and say, "Hey, could you cut us a break this time?" You never needed to lean on them to say, "Could you cut them a break?" So because of that, they're after you. This is the most nonsensical trash I've ever heard. I, I, I don't know if he understands at all what the NCAA is. Um, that's Braylon Edwards, obviously, uh, old number one, uh, former Browns wide receiver along with Michigan wide receiver. I, I, I'm more confused than I started with that. I guess I can't blame him. I don't know, man. Would I try to defend my school if they were involved in something like this? 
I think I would if I was Braylon Edwards, to be quite honest, probably. I would probably do it not so loudly and dumbly. Um, I, I would I would maybe go the route that Rich Eisen's going and just be angry and get people to stay away from me. But who knows, man? We'll see what comes of it. It was uh, It was comical. But let's get to some good news because we got some some good recruiting news. But first, let me talk to you about our sponsor, Columbus Apparel Co. At columbusapparelco.com, you can find a full line of Juck on Bucks gear, and you can get yourself all the custom T-shirts and hats you want. Get them ordered up. Get them done right. There are a million companies on a Google search that you can get this done now. Enter in your picture. Size it up. I promise you. Something about it will dissatisfy you, whether it's the blank shirt you ordered, whether it's the print, whether it's some cheap press-on stuff that they gave you, like David Sanders' junk on his website. There's always something, and you don't get a second shot. You get one shot. Columbus Apparel Co. will make sure that this is right for you. I promise. They are Buckeyes, and that's why they are here with us. They're Juckeyes, and that's why they're sponsoring the show. If you enter Juck20 on anything you order, you're going to get 20% off. And, uh, you know, let's take care of the people that take care of us in our community. These are a couple of them. Columbus Apparel Co., get your stuff there. Now, on to some good recruiting news because we got some Brady Edwards. Now, we have talked a lot about the uh, quarterback class of 2026. We don't have one. We tried to get the top 12, and nobody wants to come. And you know what? I get it. I absolutely get it. But 2027 different story. We've talked about five-star Brady Edwards, the number two quarterback in the class. Brady Edwards out of California. Brady Edwards' grandfather from Cuyahoga Falls, right next door. Shout out to my little brother who gets inducted into the Cuyahoga Falls Football Hall of Fame next Friday night at the football game. Going to be a blast. And that's where Edwards' grandfather's from. So Brady Edwards grew up an Ohio State fan. Dad went to Bo or was from Boston, which is why he's named Brady after Tom Brady. Some people have heard his name Tom Brady, worried about the Michigan connection. It's not about that. It's the Patriot connection. So Buckeye fans, Patriot fans, kids names Brady after Tom Brady. He will visit Michigan and a couple other schools, but I bring him up today because he got a crystal ball to the Buckeyes. And the gentleman that gave him the crystal ball is a guy that I trust quite a bit. I like his standards. Uh, the The... Not everybody has the same, you know, line before they'll put their name out there. This guy, he's got a pretty high one. And this isn't surprising. Brady was with Ryan Day over the summer. The way they were talking, it almost looked like the guy was going to commit at that point. He loves Ryan Day. He loves what's going on in Columbus. He loves Chip. I absolutely think this guy's going to end up a Buckeye. And again, five-star, number two quarterback in the class, six foot five. As a freshman through for 2,600 yards, he's the next one. This is a special, special quarterback right here. So big news there. Additionally, my buddy Max Torres from On3 from Scoop Duck texted me earlier and said, yo, I'm about to put a script or a crystal ball in RPM at On3 for Philip Bell to Ohio State. And he strongly believes that Philip Bell will be choosing Ohio State on Saturday. If he does, that means the wide receiver class is sealed up with Quincy Porter, Philip Bell with the top two wide receiver spots per the rankings, then Des Jones, who's the slot receiver. Then you got the project guy, Bob Penn Miller, who is just about as good of a project as you could possibly have. <clears throat> I think he's a five-star athlete, and it's kind of irritating because there is an athlete category. I don't know why they don't put him in there, because if you judged him against the other athletes, he's a five-star all day. It doesn't get much better than that, to be honest. So, Philip Bell most likely going to fill out that wide receiver class. Now, there's going to be a spot open for Jerome Miles, for sure. But I think that, you know, that pretty much ends that one, to be honest. Heartline will still pursue it. Buckeyes certainly won't be spending a whole lot of money on it um, when you've already got a four-man class. And you're happy with all four of them, because let's be honest, they got a diamond in the rough in Des Jones, and I, that even sounds stupid. He's a four-star, you know what I mean? Uh, just compared to his his skill, he's a little bit smaller and he's a slot guy and they don't generally give those guys a very high rating. But we know in college, they're absolutely as valuable as, as an X or a Y. They get the ball a ton. So 
definitely a huge value there. Dude's a stud. Quincy Porter, you know, borderline five-star guy, in my opinion. Absolute bully out there. He's big, physical, great hands. And Philip Bell, we'll watch some tape on him Saturday. Um, maybe, uh, I don't know. We'll see what time he does his announcement. If he does it early, earlier in the day before the games, we'll pop on and do his uh, live announcement. Go over some film, talk some Buckeyes pregame, and then we'll pop on, of course, for the postgame show as well. Um, if you know, I'm I've told you that Tyler Atkinson is my favorite linebacker in the class of 2026. He's out of Gwinnett County, Georgia, the one they call Yankeeville. Remember, we talked about it. Tyler Atkinson is amazing. Uh, my favorite defensive lineman in the class of 2026, also from Gwinnett County, Georgia. He has just been given a crystal ball RPG RPM to the Buckeyes. Now, this is Deuce Gerald's. Deuce Gerald's is an absolute stud. He's only six foot two, and he gets dinged a bit for that. But despite being six foot two, we're still talking about a guy who, listen, we don't follow rivals much, but he's a five star on rivals, the number 12th player in the country, the all time sack leader at his 7A high school in Georgia. So, top ranked division of Georgia football, all time sack leader for the school. 128 and a half sacks in his freshman and sophomore year. Got two more years to go, and he's the all-time sack leader. Look at his arms. He's massive, um, but the most impressive is his film, and I'm going to pull up some of these shots, just a couple of quick ones to uh, get you familiar with Deuce Geralds, who is looking like he's going to be tough to beat, and this is not the first time I've heard this. When Deuce Geralds first kind of hit the scene, he was already in on the Buckeyes when he became kind of a national recruit. We were in on him early, so we got a big jump on him. And again, from Yankeeville, as they call it in Gwinnett County, Georgia. Say with him. Say, ah! What? Say what? That's to get right. We're gonna do this. We're gonna do this. Good, girl. What? Five seconds. Keep it. Yes. Wait, set it up. That's about it. That's it. Five seconds. Go get the water. Trace, break it down. 45. Right now. Right now. Right now. Right now. Right now. Right now. See it. See it. Sit in your chair. What else do I got to say, right? I don't need to add anything. You saw it. it that's Deuce Gerald's. Um, and by the way, he was 15 right there. So I mean, like another one of these mutant uh, mutant dudes from Georgia and uh, 28 and a half sacks heading into his junior year, the all-time leader at his high school in 7A, top division of Georgia football. So absolute stud. And <laughs> they're sweating that he's 6'2". I don't give a damn how tall he is. Give me that guy. I will take that guy, and I will take each and every one of you uh, to join me tomorrow when I see you because I'm done. So I'll talk to you then. Jock and Bucks out.